Hey, this is Stan. Crow's Nest Railroad, we're back on the road today. We're over at my buddy Bob's shop, and I promise the topic is going to be riveting. So stay with us. Well, welcome back. We're on the road. Like I said, we're in Bob's shop. And we're going to take a look at the continuing saga of this Chloe steam locomotive that he's working to bring back alive. And today, I think you can see we're working on this tender portion. This is a tank that goes on the tender behind the locomotive. It carries some of the water that the locomotive is going to need. And Bob's been rebuilding this. There were some problems with it. And one of the details that he was focusing on are all of these tiny rivets. And I'm sure you've seen real locomotives. There's rivets everywhere. That's a, a great way to fasten things along with bolts. So we're going to take a look at this tender today, and Bob's going to show some really cool stuff about how to get this riveted look on this equipment. So, Bob, what was the first step? I think that you needed to make a new top for this. Is that right? That's right, Stan. Here's the original top from the original builder. I'm going to replace this because it's got some very large countersunk mounting holes, it has no rivet detail, and it doesn't fit the top anymore. After I made the repairs on the top, including some replacement of some of the smaller 1 inch diameter rivets, I found that I needed to make a whole new top. So to do that, we started off with the template. Now the template is cut pretty close to size, but I ultimately cut the actual replacement top just a little larger so I could fine fit that with a file and an abrasive uh, saw to uh, make that all fit accurately to the actual brass itself. So what we've got here then is the cardboard template, the old piece that I'm not going to use, and of course the brand new fancy piece that I am. Now you laugh because like you say, well, oh, no, no. no, it looks great. We're going to take a look at it over on the workbench, but it looks he, like you he, custom fit it. I did. He, I, I marked the top because I'm an idiot and it's easy to see that it's possible to get it flipped wrong. And once you put the rivets in wrong, they don't come out easily. So this is what we've got now and you're going to see the replacement I'm sorry, the installation of these rivets for the remaining 10 or 12 rivets. So it's already been riveted to date at this point. The circular holes that are marked will be the mounting holes for a 540 fine thread, uh, in this case actually a coarse thread, number 5 screw. It would be a stainless steel fastener with a hex head on it. It would look very similar to the rivets and it would look prototypical. So it would look very good when you look at the top of the deck. It will be correctly scaled in size. Okay, and I've got a question, Bob. I built a kit, uh, my flat car, 7.5 inch gauge flat car, was a kit from Titan Trains. And in that kit, there were a lot of riveting. Some of the rivets were structural. Some were only decorative. They had just a little screw on the back, and they were just pounded in for decoration. Are these structural, or are they decorative? Or Stan's point is well made. There are small rivet-like fasteners called drive screws and they come through various sizes numerically sized they have a slight twist in the shaft of that fastener for driving straight in to any materials in this case I did not use a drive rivet here because I had access to the back side so what I did ultimately do those are all flush on the those back. are all flush so I have a template that I used that I laid in here that I drilled through and then I spun it back over, the reason for top and bottom, so that I knew I was on the back side. And then I countersunk all those holes with my milling machine to get the precise same depth across all of them. So now, with my 332nd rivet, which was 1 16th of an inch uh, long, I was able to compress that in this fashion and make it fairly flush to those countersunk holes. Now why do you want it flush though? Because what, what? I'm going to put a gasket on here. Oh. One of the beauties of, of metal working is that it isn't watertight in most instances. And you could appreciate this as a handcrafted um, device uh, formed of brass and, and those things are susceptible to warpage as you can see by the riveting function here. It's already disturbing the flatness of this plate. 
So with a gasket running on top of this flange, we are able to seal the water tight. And you don't want water sloshing out of this because there's a wooden deck, an actual wooden plywood deck below this on this locomotive. It is a plantation type locomotive used in the Hawaiian uh, sugarcane fields. So it has a very unique water tender because they didn't have to go far between the cane fields and the water at the, uh, the uh, refining place for the sugarcane. So that's why the tender is such a strange small looking little device and why it becomes so complicated to try and get all these flanges and pieces sealed. The original builder of this did not put a flange on the top the prince said, well, if you fit your steel and your brass just right, it won't leak. Here's the reality of it. Nobody, in my expectation, has ever been able to make an edge-to-edge -edge seal that's watertight formed by brass by hand. All right, so here we're on the bench. Bob, you got this laid out. By the way, nice job on this. Um, th this cap goes here. That's correct. Now that's the original builder's work. I made a little repair work on it, but he gets credit for that effort. Okay. And that's going to be soldered in the center of that hole, which we can view by opening this up. We center it on the hole position. I clamp it down with a clamp and a bar, and then I'm going to heat this up with a torch and make that solder joint. So one more question on the rivet. So what you're saying is that that rivet is just holding sideways onto that panel. It's not a squeeze, it a is, nut and a bolt it situation. It is actually squeezed. If you could imagine this is the hole and we have a V contour all the way around there, when we mash that shaft of the rivet down, it spreads out. And when it spreads out into that countersunk hole, then you find that you are holding that rivet mechanically in place. It does not require solder. Whoa, we're back in my shop for a second. After I looked at the filming that we did, I wasn't sure if it was clear what Bob was talking about. So let's take a quick look at the sketch. Here's his hammer. Here's that block that has a round dimple drilled out of it to accept the head of the rivet. This is our rivet here. Now this is the brass panel that's going to get riveted. There won't be any gap here. This brass panel will be sitting tight to this fixture here. And then he's going to wham on this end of the rivet. And because the hole that he put in the sheet was countersunk on the back, you can see it has a funnel shaped space on the back. When he beats on this rivet, it's going to fill in and hang on by filling in those little gaps and then this won't be here this will be gone it'll all be mashed flat in that little cone shaped pit so I hope that's easier to understand what he's doing and that way this is all smooth so he can put the gasket on here so we're gonna see the technique I hope that, that you're using but that well, you know, when they build bridges, they always heated. They heated all the exactly. rivets that they used for the bridge work. For a real structural construct, the rivet was long enough that they used a bucking bar on the back side of it. So the rivet goes into the hole red hot. Now think about that. This guy's throwing that rivet up to the guy above him who catches it in a, in a funnel. He aligns it with the hole, pushes it through the hole, and the guy on the back side is a pneumatic hammer that hammers that head mushroom shaped. And then as the rivet cools, it shrinks. And it's the shrinkage that tightens the rivet. Yeah. Not necessarily the guy bucking on the back side. It is that mechanical cooling that pulls that rivet tight. But we don't have that we advantage do not have here. That here. We, no, okay. No. All right. So I'm wearing safety glasses because even though it's a copper rivet, it's a steel hammer, there's a steel plate that I'm hammering down onto. Uh, things happen, so you want to protect yourself as best you can, and that includes your eyes. Well, and of course, Norm would wear safety glasses. And he would always say you should read and understand the manual that <laughs> comes with your hammer. To make <laughs> That's sure. right. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to take it, working from the top now, and from underneath, from the top, I mean to say, we're going to push this rivet underneath. And then we're going to come over here with this rivet. There's a hole, a countersunk hole, in this top plate. And that hole is precisely sized in diameter and depth that makes this rivet head on the end of this rivet 
fit precisely in that hole. So when you've done that, and you can see that just right there. Okay, I'm zoomed way in, so I can see that clearly. So that's what's looking like. This shaft sticks up through the thickness of the brass, and it's that shaft that sticks through the hole that I'm going to mash here shortly. So I'm okay. going to put this on now, and if you'll give me just a moment to feel it in place, you'll note that I'm not putting it in the holes that are identified with the black circles, because that's where we're going to put the fasteners ultimately when we're all done here. But that's not any too much. When this comes down, I feel for the hole. I make sure by rocking it back and forth that it's in the hole, because once I do this, there's no undoing it. And there we are. We're struck and we're flat. And there on the other side, there's the rivet that we just produced. And we'll keep doing this all the way around the hole. Uh, remainder of this uh, tender top in the same similar fashion. We take this, we put this out, we grab this guy. Alright, and so we've got another successful rivet. Good, 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 good. Let me uh, zoom in and... Oh, yeah. Alright, Bob, tell me, what sort of a drill bit did you use to get a spherical hole on that metal so right in this there. case, Stan, it actually turns out to be a standard 118 degree included angle drill bit. So it's the stuff you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. Those drill bits, even though they're uh, 180 degrees included angle, which isn't spherical, by the time this rivet gets smashed in there and centered, it is, for all intents and purposes, circular on the top. So you can get by with that trick. The problem is getting this hole exactly the right depth. If it goes too deep, you can't mash the rivet on the back side of this flat because it allows the rivet to pass too far into the block and you can't get a good mush on the mash. The other hand, if it's too short, then you distort the head of the rivet and you mash the head of the rivet out. So there's a happy medium. Yeah, right you get in that there. mushroom thing where the guy, it like flanges that's out like the flanges brim of a hat. out like that. Yep, you've yep. got it. So you don't want that ideally. So this is a very critical distance. Wow, that was fantastic. Bob, thank you so much. It's so awesome to uh, see your work here in the shop and to see what you're doing with this Chloe. We'll be back soon to check on the progress. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you right here next time on the Crossness Railroad. Mm -hmm.